Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, my name is Chris Myers Ash. I'm a member of the editorial board of Washington History Magazine. I used to edit the magazine way back when, um, and uh, it's the publication of the DC History Center. And we are very pleased tonight to present the, a program on Between Freedom and Equality, the History of an African-American Family in Washington, DC by Barbara Boyle Torrey and Clara Myrick Green. In addition to the authors, I'll be joined tonight by James Fre Fisher and Tanya Gaskins Hardy, who co-authored the foreword to this book. So I have some questions prepared, uh, but I invite you all to submit questions as well as they occur to you. You can use the Q&A button on your Zoom screen, uh, and you can also upvote, you know, put a little thumbs up uh, next to questions in the queue that you also would like to have answered. And uh, we'll do our best to get to as many questions as, as we can in the hour we have uh, together. And so now I'd like to invite the rest of the speakers to, uh, to join me on screen, join us all here. So we'll have Barbara Boyle Torrey and Clara Myrick Green, Tanya Hardy, James Fisher. Thank you all for joining us. It's great to see you. Wonderful. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. So. I'm very excited because uh, I, I go a little bit back with this uh, with this whole project because back when I was editor of Washington History Magazine, uh, Barbara and Clara came to me with a, a rough draft of this really exciting research that they had about this family uh, in in Washington, Northwest Washington, actually right in the neighborhood I grew up in 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 Chevy Chase. I went to Lafayette Elementary School and come to find out all this information about the school I went to that I didn't know before, uh, thanks to this uh, fantastic research. And we ended up publishing it in, in Washington History Magazine uh, a few years back, a beautiful article. Um, and that article has, has now blossomed into this uh, full length book. And so thank you so much, Barbara and Clara, for your, your research. And I know Tanya and James wrote the foreword and have, have much longer and deeper connections to this project, uh, certainly than any of us have. And so what I'd like for you to do first um, is just introduce yourselves uh, and how you came to this topic. So Barbara, you, Barbara and Clara, you go ahead. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll start. I, um, we, uh, uh, we were working on the local history, and at during that period, we actually saw a reference to a letter by a former slave, and he became an engineer for George Washington's Potomac Company, and we thought, who is this man? Why don't we know about him? And what happened? And that's how we got started. We live along the Potomac River in the area where this man, George Pointer, lived. And so that interest was, that is an added interest for us. Plus some discoveries along that area, uh, Gunpowder Magazine. So that's how we, started really our research and our interest in George Pointer. Wonderful. And for the audience who, who may not know you, could you tell us which one of you is Barbara and which one of you is Clara so everyone knows? <laughs> Clara. <laughs> All right, so we have Clara on, on, on my left and, and Barbara on the, on the right. Um, and Tanya and James, how did you come to this subject? Um, well, I'm a genealogist uh, historian. And I love researching family histories. So when I met James not too long after <clears throat> uh, I met him, I asked him, had he ever had his family um, history research? And he said, no, you know, nothing. I don't really, not interested in that. And I said, well, I am. And give me just a little bit of information and I'll run with it. And so I did that <clears throat> and began to find out a lot about his family and the fact that they had lived in the Chevy Chase area. Um, and through my research, I had a knock on my uh, internet door from Tiggy and Barbara who said, hey, wait a minute. I think we might know of someone who's related to someone in the tree that you're building right now. And that's how we came to get to know them and join this wonderful journey. 
Wonderful. Well, that, that sums it up, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, great. You know what? I think what what I'd love to hear from from you all. That tell us, tell tell the audience um, a bit more about this man, George Pointer, and and this remarkable letter that he penned uh, more than two centuries ago. Well, I'll, I'll start. He he. Uh, wrote this letter when we found it we went to the national archives to find it after we had seen the reference to it and it was a when we found it we were stunned because he writes better than either one of us and he has a much better memory than for things in the distant past than we had and he actually gave it a lot of details about his life and we but you know, you can't trust that. So what we did is we, ah, that's the letter. Um, that's the beginning of his letter. You can see the handwriting and you'll never see ours. Um, this was, um, he was describing his uh, career with the George Washington's Potomac Company. And it was a, um, uh, it was so compelling that that's when we began reach, trying to figure out who he was, what happened to him. And um, that was the beginning. The, the letter was written to the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal Company that was taking over the company begun, the canal company begun by George Washington. And this is uh, right after that transfer had taken place. He wrote this in, in uh, 20, 1829, uh, asking, tell, telling his career, all about his career with the uh, working for George Washington's uh, Potomac Company and all that he had done and his uh, rising to become named uh, engineer for the company. And then he asked that the house that he had been given as a, a young enslaved uh, guy of 13, who first started working for the company, he had been given a place to live along the river. And he was now, when he wrote the letter, he was in danger of losing the house because it was in the path of a new canal or, or somewhere there. And that was the reason for his letter. And, and to whom was it addressed? And, and what was he hoping would, would happen uh, as a result of his letter? that they would save his house, that he wouldn't lose his house. And he also complained that uh, his fish traps called fish pots, which he had uh, constructed over a period of years where he caught fish and sold at the market were, were being destroyed. They were right in the river and they were being destroyed because they were the, the men building uh, the new CNO canal were removing the stones uh, to to build the new canal, and it, it, he, he said, I'm being destroyed by this. And he was appealing for that to be for some kind of reparation for that. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. You know, it's interesting to me to, to you know, the, the issue of displacement and, and, and people's homes being destroyed in the name of progress it, it is apparently quite an old story in, in uh, the nation's capital here. Uh, so th there's a question from the audience just to clarify. So how did you find out about this letter in the first place? We, we a, a great book uh, written by Robert Cash, who uh, is a historian of the Potomac Canal, the original, uh, George Washington's original canal, had a reference to this letter and because we had been uh, writing some of the history, we thought we've never seen this. Um, uh, we've never heard of this guy. And Caps actually quoted some from it. And so it was really a, a terrific lead and, lead. and it's a very good book for anybody who's interested in the detailed history of the Potomac Canal. So of course we need to know was was his home saved? Where, where, was he able to to live happily ever after, so to speak? Well, we what we know is in the 1830 census, he had the same neighbors as he had in the 1820 census. 
So we assume that they, that he was living in the same place. Um, and his son, we believe, continued living there. Yeah. After Pointer's death and probably 32 during an epidemic. But that his son appears, W.A. Pointer, living in that same area with the same neighbors. So apparently they saved his house. Yeah. But we really don't know. So tell us, con connect the family. So this is a little bit further north on the Potomac River, uh, where George Pointer's original house was. Uh, and, but eventually the family makes their way into Washington proper. Uh, tell us about their journey. What, what happened was the, um, his granddaughter, who was the one who was on the uh, uh, barge trip up the Potomac with him, um, uh, eventually married uh, a man from, uh, from Maryland, actually. Uh, and they moved during the 1830s when race relations, as you know, Chris, uh, really uh, became very difficult. They actually moved out to what was a very rural part of the district, which was then called Washington County. And uh, a few years later, they, they bought a two acre farm out there and raised three generations on, on this farm, which then eventually became Lafayette School or Chris went to school. So before we leave George Pointer himself, uh, tell us a bit. We have a, a question from the audience. How did he come to be so educated? I mean, this is a, a time he was growing up in a time, obviously, of of slavery. He was born into into slavery himself. Uh, there aren't black schools. There aren't public schools for either black or white children. But there are very few educational opportunities for black children. How does he come to write so well? We don't know. We use a quote in the book um, from Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass learned over the shoulders of little white boys and he would try to get them to teach him how to write. That is, uh, we, we believe we know who the person that uh, enslaved uh, George Pointer. And uh, there, there was a child his age born in that family, a little boy, the same age. So perhaps that's how, but we don't know. So, so they eventually the, the family settles in Washington County, the, the part of Upper Northwest. Um, tell us about how the, 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 the matriarch of that farm uh, that you learned so much about. So interesting. You know, when you look over the six generations that we, we developed, um, uh, she is the capstone. We can tie her directly back to her grandfather at, in a legal document in 1838. And she is uh, uh, in the, she is talked about in the Washington Post 1928 um, uh, uh, article. So we know she's the one that everybody else in the story is connected to. And she had eight children? Eight, children. eight and five survived. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, adulthood yeah and and she was real she must have been an extraordinary woman they her children said that she was over a hundred when she died but we can't verify that um she was not there in the 1910 census so we think she was probably in her late 80s when she died Wonderful. What a, she's, she's an extraordinary woman. So I'd love to, to bring uh, Mr. Fisher into this conversation here. So tell us, tell us how you are connected to George Pointer and the descendants of the Pointer family. I believe I'm the eighth generation. He's, he, uh, George Pointer was um, uh, eighth generation grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Um. <laughs> and so how did you come to learn about the research that was that that Barbara and Clara were conducting into what your family? 
which they didn't know they didn't know at the time. <laughs> but but how did you how did you come to find out about about this letter and George Pointer and and all this research? Well, uh, reach back reaching back, my memory uh, is a little different from uh, Tanya's. Uh, I was uh, serving her some wine at the time, so. Um, <laughs> Uh, what I recall is we uh, having a conversation, asking her about a project that she was working on, um, historical, uh, and I got interested in her findings for, for that particular client. Mm -hmm. She wasn't charging at the time. So I uh, mentioned that I uh, periodically, um, I would say that, you know, I would be interested in finding out what would my family uh, tree reveals. And um, she slid up beside me and she started um, uh, interrogating me about my family. So uh, the, the day it began. And um, I think we worked work like nonstop. Um, uh, for a while, and we were into um, close to three generations before she stopped. Mm -hmm. And she um, flipped the switch on me and started asking me about my father's side. So um, within three to four weeks, we had um, traveled um, back to the 1700s on my father's side. So then we switched back to uh, my, um, my mother's side um, and we did what we could do and we took a little break and um, within that, that time period, uh, Tiggy and Barbara, uh, I guess she discovered um, the family tree on um, Ancestral Calm. And she sent me, uh, they sent me an email asking me did I know that they thought they were pretty sure that my family was the family that they had been searching for? And did I know uh, that I had a famous ancestral grandfather? So I had to read that three times because I was frozen. So um, um, after that, uh, we exchanged some more and uh, we, we pretty, I think we met up pretty, pretty quickly. And, um, um, and it was, a, it was a super time travel for me to go from th three generations where we had stopped to go all the way back that far. So um, um, you know, that was a miracle. Um, and further, um, we, um, she, she said that we, you know, my family had owned property, um, and, um, it, it was just amazing. It was amazing. That's wonderful that, to, to see how the, the, the strands inter intersected. Um, thinking about, uh, Mary, so Marianne Plummer Harris, right? That was the name of the, the, the matriarch of the family that we talked about, some of the, the, the listeners were asking about her name. So Marianne and her, and her husband, they, they get, get this farm. Tell us about the farm in, in Northwest and, and uh, the lives that they led there. And then what happened to it? I'll, t I'll tell you something really interesting about it. It was across a dirt road, which is now Broad Branch Road. Uh, from a major um, uh, uh, estate, a uh, thousand acres of the, the Belt family itself. And, and the, it was very interesting. We, Tiggy and I have watched how this changed over time uh, in terms of who was living there. So it was a mixed community. There were immigrants living there, um, uh, white, white teachers, um, the, the uh, Harrises were living there and other uh, black families. So that it was, it was, it was quite, it was much more 
mixed than we would have thought. It will, I mean, it doesn't mean there wasn't racism, but it does mean that what happened is all the kids played together. And so you have a very different kind of dynamic on that. And in fact, in our story, we've got in two generations, when people grew up, they helped each other, their, their childhood friends, um, so that there was a dynamic that continued on until adulthood. So when the, uh, the son, the oldest son, right before the Civil War, uh, uh, Mary uh, Harris wanted to go to Georgetown to work, he needed a freedom certificate because he would not be able to work, certainly not safely and probably leaving legally. And it was a white neighbor woman, a lady named Parker, who swore that she had known his mother and him since he was a baby. So that was 20 years by then he was 20. Mm -hmm. And so with this white person being able to st state that she knew that his mother was free since slavery went through the mother, then he could have this freedom certificate. And that was an example of how um, neighbors kind of watched out for one another. If we say neighbors, these houses weren't close together the way we think of neighbors, the way we think of Chevy Chase now. It was rural, but people did know one another and, and helped one another, both races. Mm -hmm. So maybe talk a little bit more about what happened to that community because you know I mean I think you're right you know a lot of a lot of folks don't realize that 19th century DC was was in a lot of ways more integrated uh, not just racially but economically uh, than than DC of the the late 20th and early 21st century became uh, and so this community is, is rural it's it's interracial it's also they're there's a thousand acre estate and there's a two acre estate and there's a three, you know, and, and so people are living at different stations in, in, in life in relatively close proximity. What happens? Tell us what happens to this community. I'll tell you something uh, that we really the found at the uh, DC History Center. The, uh, the library is terrific. And we looked at the real estate maps from the 19th century of who was living where, and you could see um, uh, this, oh, it must have been about 20 acres, and who was living where, and then 10 years later, you could see it again, and how it had changed, and it was quite, um, it was packed, and what happened in 1900 is the, um, oh, good, Barry, you've got it. This is On an early map. map showing the estates around, and that Right. pink triangle sort of in the red in the middle uh pink yeah. and yellow yeah and the hair the, 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 there was mary Moulton. these uh, you can't <laughs> you can't see my finger but it's that triangle in the middle right um yes right that's right. exactly right for your so what so what you could do with the um uh, real estate maps that that the dc history center had is it was able to, we could see how this changed over time. And then we could see how the real estate developers in 1900 began moving out and uh, began, they started in Maryland and then came back into Chevy Chase, DC, beginning to make little uh, uh, track homes in, in what they called Chevy Chase, there you go. And, but the Harrises are still there. In their pink triangle, you've got the Harrises and Mary Moulton is the daughter. And, and you can see they're facing the Broad Branch Road right there. And, uh, but on the other side of the road now, you have hundreds of white families moving in. And what those white families needed is they were, uh, they, they, they were young, and they, they had children and they needed schools. So what the DC government did is said, we need to build a school and decided to use that area, the, the pink triangle where the Motons and Harris's were to build their school. Because that's, well, we don't know, but 
that's where a number of black households. Yeah, the households right below that triangle were also black. All of those, yes. those right. names, they were all uh, uh, black folks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and so that's where they decide to build their school. They don't build it in the the um, vacant lot over to the right. They build it right smack where people's houses are. And what they were doing is they could use eminent domain. And I did not realize this. I thought that it was all um, uh, covenants saying that people couldn't sell to uh, people who weren't like them um, uh, that, that started the segregation. It was this eminent domain that they actually were able to require everybody to sell their houses in, in that triangle there. They, they did sell it at a market price. We have a real estate ad for it the same year over uh, closer to the river. And they, if they were given, the amount of money they were given was a market rate, but they couldn't buy anything that was being built there because they all had a restricted covenants in it. So all of us, by, by 1930, that's a vacant lot where they were all living. And I think it was three years later that the uh, uh, Lafayette School opened up there. Wow. Yeah, that, so that's that's really that's really fascinating. And and so I know that some of the some of the questions just to to contextualize some of this. So this area is that we're looking at on this screen is in upper northwest Washington. Uh, broad branch. So, so so what we're looking at where it says 2011, 2012, that area is uh, is now Lafayette school <laughs> it's it's the, well, and, and the, pit and, and the park yeah. uh surrounding the school yeah. um actually so, you see the road that goes right up to the word branch the ch mm -hmm. of branch that uh -huh. is Patterson, and that goes right to the park next to the school and the, par the school itself is a bit farther uh south or down below in that mm -hmm. yeah down that's about where the school is and when and we first found looked at maps we didn't envision that there was a school there. We were looking old maps like this. And then when we went out to Chevy Chase, we saw there's a park. And then we thought, well, that's not bad. And then we found more information and realized, no, that's they didn't sell to a developer. They had to sell to the government for the building of the school. Right. So that, and that's something, you know, often the government is working together with the developers at this time. You know, of course, this is the era of commissioner rule in DC history, and so uh, there were the city was ruled by three white commissioners who worked very closely with their their friends in Congress and you know in, in the federal government, and so and also worked hand in glove with the Washington Board of Trade and, and developers in the city. They shared the same interests, and uh, certainly the interest here was to to provide a school for all these white families. And, and for them, the logical place was the, you know, the, the, the la what looks like the last remaining black families in this area. Um, and so you know, one, one, of our, one of our viewers, Tim, um, notes that, that it looks like the, the Harris family, the, the farm was actually divided into five lots. Was that for each of the surviving children, the five surviving children? The original and, granddaughter, Mary Harris, did that before she died. Mm -hmm. She wanted, she saw this development and she said, I need to give a lot to each one of the four, um, five children. Yeah, which she did. Yeah. Well, you think of what it must have looked like. Here they are sitting on much larger plots of land, uh, looking over at these tiny little houses, but these people are the the tiny little houses are taking over the entire neighborhood. And I I have thought and looked at that and realized what that must have felt like as they saw these people uh, surrounding them. And and it really is. I mean, if you if you've been to that area, it's it it's a rise. And so that that area that we're looking at where the school now is is on top of a hill that would literally 
you, if they could see yeah. those developments encroaching, getting closer and, and closer as, as time goes on. Um, and so the federal government comes in and basically says, we need you to move, here's some money, yeah. uh, and, and, they have to, and they have to move. Now, yeah. what happened, do you, so what happens next? You know, it's a, it's a vacant lot for a while, but then how soon does, does the school go up? I, I think it's about three years, but there is a, just a painful uh, Washington Post story 10 years later, 10 years, that, that, that said, oh, it's so wonderful. This new school is so great. And it was built on barren land. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Harrises lived here for 80 years. And other neighbors. It wasn't yeah. barren land at all. It was yeah. an integrated community of people out in the country. And they had supported themselves beautifully. Yeah. Well, that's why your research is so important because other people, researchers coming later, researching that area. You know, I remember when I was in sixth grade at Lafayette, I did a, a history project uh, on the area, on Chevy Chase. And so what would I do? I, well, I'd go and look at old newspapers or go and look at only you know, these written documents, uh, which were often, you know, they, they, they're told from a per certain perspective. And if I read that article, I think, oh my gosh, there was nothing, nothing here, right? It was just barren land, right? right? And then that's right. how that misunderstanding, that's how, how, how that, uh, that, that wrong history is passed on and on and on, right? And so by, by coming back and doing this research and the kind of research that, that Tanya's been doing, uh, you know, of unearthing these stories and finding these people and where they lived is so important because it's it's correcting the historical record, right? It's 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 putting people, putting real people back into the story, and oh. and, and that's so terribly important. Exactly. Uh, Chris. And, and you know, and that's typical of the whitewashing that's gone on with history of what's been going on with African Americans, not only in this area but in, in lots of areas when it comes to eminent domain the government decides we're gonna take this because um, they don't need it or they don't have to have it. We're not gonna take it from the other folks. And then they don't tell the truth about it. I, when we had the reunion on the property, the Pointer family actually had a reunion on the property in 2015. It was amazing how many people in the community came up to us and said, what's going on? You know, well, what are you all doing here? And when we explained that this was family land and we're finally quote unquote back home, to, to celebrate, they all said the same thing. But we were told this was vacant land. There was nobody here. So it was, it was, it was quite, it was quite an experience. Um, it was good to see that practically everyone that we spoke to was surprised and and cheered us on to be doing this. And you know, we were, we're so sorry we didn't know that that happened. You mean to tell me their land was taken? So. Um, it's just part of the process. What we're trying to do is, is, is continue to get rid of all this whitewashing and tell the truth about what the history really was for this area and other areas. Right, and so, and, and to, to help people understand where, where the privilege comes from, you know, so a little white kid like me grows up in this essentially you know, largely all white neighborhood of the 1980s. I have no idea, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. no one at that time was, was, was telling me about what used to exist, not actually that long before, right? you know, half a century yes. before, um, this was a very different kind of community and a century before that, even, even more different. Um, what's interesting, I see on our, on our chat box, we have uh, Retta Vincent says that uh, her great grandfather was Joshua Johnson and she mm -hmm. believes that it, he is the Joshua Johnson who has the, uh, that lot right next to Mary Moten here. And so, um, you know, so the, 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 the connections, we were seeing all kinds of connections and, and Tim, uh, who's been very active in, in helping unearth uh, a lot of this local history, particularly in Chevy Chase, he tells us about how the Chevy Chase Citizens Association, which it was a, you know, an all white citizens group, uh, had a very active subcommittee that was involved in pushing for the building of the school on this property. Yeah. And as, you know, as Barbara and Clara note, they chose that property for a reason, 
right? And, and maybe you could talk uh, a bit more about how how citizens groups, the new white homeowners who are coming into this area, uh, tell us what you know about how they viewed this property, these black landowners on the hill right above them. Who was that directed to? To I, whoever would like to to, to take it. Um, um, you how they viewed it, um, uh, accessible, because black people live there; they own their property. So uh, that that was that'll be the easiest route for them to take is to take something from black people. Uh, let me go back. You, we, we used the reference farm. The land was a farm. Um, <clears throat> in my spirit, everything that I know about what they did on the property, what they used the property for, uh, rings out um, village. Village. It was a proper African village. They transformed the land as their family needed. Um, the space was used for the family. Um, so um, I draw that distinction um, because when they took the land, they destroyed the village, um, not just a farm. It was, it marked uh, the destruction of my family. And that, that's one of the reasons I was curious to know um, the flavor of my family tree. I wanted to know, were we ever closer? Uh, uh, were, were, were we ever stronger? Were ever, uh, so um, I found um, the taking of that village marked the decline and family unity, and it never recovered. One, one remarkable thing about the Harris family, the, the granddaughter's family, it was very exactly what you're describing, what, what James is describing. It was a close, strong family. Even when two of the sons had to move, one to uh, for job to New York and became a Pullman porter, the other went to Buffalo, New York, and became a, a section in a huge cathedral. They both kept their family ties. The one in Buffalo had no children and left his house to his sister's daughter. Uh, the, the one that went to became the Pullman Porter came back to the farm to help uh, with a family when his dad died, when, when Mary Harris's husband Thomas died. So that was tied to the land but it was a family that was strong and unified. So it's interesting to hear James talk about that loss of village. And, and uh, one of our, our viewers notes, uh, Mariana notes that, that losing this land, you know, and as you said, it's, it's, it's a big lot. It's not like the, 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 mini, you know, the smaller lots that the developers are building for, for single family homes. This is a bigger lot, you know, it's part of, that they probably had gardens, you know, that they, that, Losing this land wasn't just losing the land; it was also losing uh, income, self-sufficiency. Right? You, 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 they probably provided for themselves uh, with a, with food from that from that land. Um, and we have another question about that for Mr. Fisher. Was there ever any reparation? I mean, they they were paid for for that land, but were were was your family ever able to realize? You know, realize any real estate capital gains or anything of, of that nature from that land afterward? Um, no. Um, uh, once uh, a pocket money um, is set, I mean, it, it was total destruction. They were there for 80 years. They had uh, jobs uh, that they could readily get to. Uh, they had support of the community. They were, they were a part of the uh, support network for the community. Um, and um, to be um, 
ushered in, you know, uh, it was two places that they ended up. That's Northwest and Southeast. And both of those places I was raised, first in North, Northwest, Northwest mm -hmm. and Southeast uh, mainly. It, it was the only thing that they, that they could afford. So um, it disrupted their whole, their whole lives. Um, um, and, and to a point where, you know, uh, my memory uh, is that, uh, and my sister reminded, there was several families, several families in, uh, uh, on top of each other, uh, living, uh, surviving. So, um, um, I struggle with the knowledge. I mean, uh, you know, uh, what land, what that land could have meant for our family, uh, generations of of my family. So I struggle with that, even even now, knowing it. Absolutely. And, I want the land back. <laughs> yeah, and, and and I mean, look at that land now, right? Give it, give it's, it back. <laughs> it's some of the most valuable real estate in the city uh, at this point, you know, up at, up in Chevy Chase, and so. Uh, it, it's uh, it's a real it's a real loss, um, and you know. So I'm curious, one of the the, the question you know, you're talking about how you're struggling with with this this knowledge. How has how has Lafayette Elementary dealt with with this new research about the very land that it sits upon? How, how have the school officials or the principal or students? Um, I think the, the, the kids, uh, when we went to lecture there, um, um, they embraced, uh, they embraced me, uh, the story that was very interested in the story that, uh, some great, great questions. Um, and it was very sympathetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the children were, were amazing. We spent some time with fourth, fifth and sixth graders, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was all, all grades, um, talking to them about the land and what had happened and um they all were some first of all very surprised you know and they couldn't understand how could they take your home and um you know where did you go and how, did they give you any money and um can't you get it back they were all just very much involved in trying to understand why it happened and then kind of figure out how can that be fixed because it needs to be fixed so it was a, a very um, interesting time with the kids, and I was just very proud. I'm an ex-educator, so I was very thrilled to see those young people have such wonderful questions and be so involved and so compassionate about what they were hearing and um, trying to figure out, well, how can this be fixed? Well, it sounds like you're not ex-educator. You're still still doing a lot of ed educating, um, maybe just in a different form. Yes. Uh, but, but uh, you know, what's interesting to know, you know, this this is not a unique experience, right? It's not like, oh, this only happened in this one right. spot. I and mean, this, this was happening in different places across the city. And I think, you know, Mr. Fishing, we made, made a really important point, which is that once they're, they're pushed out, where do they go? You know, by this time, it's not the integrated, largely rural Washington County that, they, that they'd bought a farm in decades before by the early mid 20th century, developers have come in, rest restrictive covenants are in place. Much of the city is, is off limits to, to black homeowners. Mm -hmm. you know? And so they can't just go anywhere else, right? They, so they, you know, they're, they're hemmed into to different areas uh, of the city, as, as you mentioned, especially more and more pushed uh, over into, into Southeast Washington. So uh, this is happening in Tenley Town. It's happening in, in other, you know, for, for Woodrow Wilson and Deal, uh, schools also going up in a similar kind of situation. Mm -hmm. so, so this is happening to create the city that, that then I grew up in, that many of us you know, moved to or you know, grew, grew up in and lived in, um, that we thought was just natural. And it, it wasn't natural, it was created. Mm -hmm. uh, by, by policies and, and, and development. Um, I, I did want to point out, Tim's noting that that, um, that area is now, they push to have it, to have the name changed at least to Lafayette Pointer Park and Recreation Center, uh, and that there's gonna be a dedication date coming up soon and sign and, and, and other things. Um, 
And so, uh, so just look, I'm trying to keep, keep up. There's so many, everybody's so interested. They're just peppering the, uh, the, <laughs> the Q and A with, with all kinds of, uh, all yeah. kinds of questions. Um, I'd love to, to hear in a question from, uh, from one of our viewers about your family, Mr. Fisher. So, so you talk about how you've struggled with this knowledge. You know, this is, this is difficult history to, to learn. How has your family reacted? The extended family, you know, who are also descendants of the of the pointers. How have how have they reacted? Different, <laughs> different. Um, um, I mean, it was it's about survival and and trying to be happy in life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my spirit has this thing about fairness. What is fair and what is not? Mm -hmm. If it's not fair, then I have a problem. <laughs> so, uh, whereas you know, family members, um, um, they're more accepting, um, and um, they go on with their lives. They, you know, um, are wonderful. They're wonderful, and um, but um, they're, they're interested in family history. Uh, um, I, it 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 took George Pointer to get us to have that family reunion, that information, uh, that family reunion. We hadn't, I couldn't remember um, one um, prior to the uh, Lafayette um, Pointer Park reunion. So that brought us together. Mm -hmm. um, so um, they, they're being more supportive. They're, they're joining in. They're helping out with the different things that's coming out of the growing knowledge of, you know, family history. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I, I'm, I take it harder than anyone, you know, in the family. Um, and, and it's probably for a personal reason. I was, I didn't have a male role model in my life. And I started out being curious about history um, before I was about eight, eight mm -hmm. years old. I, 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 I couldn't find anything. Um, I couldn't understand it. So I naturally uh, ventured into world history to try to even figure out, you know, when did uh, slavery become exclusively uh, black. Um, so, um, and and also, why aren't we closer? Why is the family this the way it is in disarray? Mm -hmm. um, so, discovery um, it, it brings upon pride but the mixed feelings of pride and anger mm -hmm. um, after being misled by history for so long um, and then coming up on an age, which is now where the truth is finally being spoken. Uh, but I needed it when I was eight, nine or 10 years old. Mm -hmm. I needed the, the hero, I needed the, uh, I needed to do, uh, read George Porner's letter. I need to. I, I needed to gain strength and direction from him. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Yeah, so thinking about the the process, I know some of the the our our readers or our viewers are interested in in the in this process of history. And you've talked about this, Mr. Fisher, and, and you know, about how things have been whitewashed or left out. And so in, in the process of, of rediscovering and, you know, retelling, you know, finding this history, um, maybe Barbara and Claire, you could talk a little bit about the research process. Like how do you unearth this, this history? Um, one question was, did you use the DC archives? Were they avail available for your research? Like how do you tell these stories that have been hidden? You know, we started with, um, Sort of the scaffolding of the decennial censuses. You have to figure out where people were. And because the Pointer family from the 1800 census on was free, they we could 
we could see their names. So if we were able to use that, but it's not enough. The census tells you only the bare amount. So we then just had to simply go back into archives. The National Archives in Hyattsville are absolutely terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes you forever. And it's, um, um, but it's, but they have a huge amount of stuff there and they're eager to help because most people don't ever ask them any questions. Uh, but the other wonderful resource is, is uh, the Montgomery County Historical Society, mm -hmm. um, Maryland Historical Society, DC. People have been saving a lot of things and we were able to build the story using uh, that. So what else would you do? Well, one of the big important finds was the freedom certificates at Montgomery County yeah. and Historical Society showing the name, not only of uh, uh, you know, the, the original Poitier's uh, wife, who's Elizabeth Townsend, and we never were able to find anything more about her. And then, and then that they named, and then her daughter, who was Mary, and everybody was named Mary for the next three generations. And then Mary, you know, Mary Plummer, and then Mary uh, Plummer Harris. And so, and then there's another, several more Marys after that. But if we hadn't had that one document, it would have been much harder. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of things you just find here and there at various historical societies, and we were very lucky. It's a lot of detective work, a lot of uh, a lot of old fashioned, you know, for all the stuff that's online, there's still a lot of old fashioned, like going through documents and, and a lot of patience. Um, I see that we're running out of time here and I just want, want to make one uh, clarification. I, 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 I like for you to ask Tanya the same question mm -hmm. because uh, you know, we, we went quite a few places and she might have some in, in her memory. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I was going to just say, too, that with the research that Tiggy and Barbara were doing and the research that I was doing, and then we would compare um, what we had found, too, which was very helpful because that helped to um, confirm, yes, we are going in the right direction because we would find something or I would find something, some of the information that I find found prior to meeting with them, um, you know, helped to seal everything. So it was a joint effort and it was it was really exciting. We would all get excited when we'd find something and say, oh my goodness, you know, we, we found this document or we found this map and um, we spent a lot of time together in those archives and other places. So it takes a lot of time, a lot of patience and finding those diamonds, those little pieces that bring everything together is just the best. That, that makes it even much, even more fun. Yeah, I mean, it seemed when I was reading through your side, it seemed like you were working backward from the present, you know, you, you know, with genealogy sort of tracing the roots and they had started in like the 1770s and they were kind of moving forward. And then right. you guys kind of met, you know, and, and started fi finding the same stuff or, you know, confirming each other's uh, research. So it's kind of yes. a, a great uh, symbiotic uh, relation, research relationship here. Wow. Um, so before we, we wrap things up, I want to make sure each of you has has a chance to you know, put in your last word. I know there's been a lot of talk about the the sale of the farm and the use of eminent domain when the federal government come, comes in. Um, and the federal government has to provide what's called just compensation, which is often interpreted as market value, but does not necessarily, I mean, because what is market value at any right. given point in time? So the federal government determines what just compensation is. Mm -hmm. And then you have to accept that. When the government uses the power of eminent domain, it's not a free will sale, right? Okay. You, you cannot, you you are going to move. Exactly. This, this well, is what you're getting for it. Exactly. Uh, well, that's kind of opening up what you had the government, the white government mm -hmm. with the white land developers mm -hmm. most likely came up with a valuation of the land. I'm gonna stay where we can get the black people. Mm -hmm. okay. And if they didn't want to move, they didn't have a choice in the matter. And we saw we saw this exactly in in, in many different places in Tenleytown, Reno, and mm -hmm. and other places where the black homeowners were pretty clear that they did not want to move, and that's what compelled. So developers would offer them money, and the the landowners often were like, "No, we're we're happy, thank you." 
And so that's why the developers turned in the early 20th century to use the power of the federal government because they couldn't use money. <laughs> the, the, the money wasn't moving the people. And so the power of eminent domain was, was needed in their mind to get these folks off the land that the developers wanted. Um, so we, we do just have time for just a quick, you know, last word from each of you, uh, you know, maybe starting with you, Mr. Fisher, you know, something that you want to leave our audience with uh, that you think is important to know about your family's story. Um, I'm blessed to have the team to work uh, with me to be motivated, uh, to be inspired uh, by uh, the family story, to work to uh, bring greater acknowledgement um, and um, uh, honor to uh, people who deserved it, uh, my family and, the, the, you know, uh, um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm mad, but I'm, I'm, I'm totally grateful for the, the, the blessing of have this, this very special hardworking group of people, including you, uh, to uh, put this in the public view uh, and to keep it going and keep it moving. And hopefully uh, we'll be in a big black museum downtown shortly with uh, uh, a uh, exhibit and his story because it's so inspiring. I took a great, a great uh, pride and and knowledge, in learning about uh, uh, my ancestors that really left a mark uh, on on Washington D.C. Thank wonderful. you. Yeah. Thank you, Tanya. What what what, what do you want to leave us with tonight? Um, it's been a long time coming. This has been a journey, journey, journey. And I'm just excited that we've gotten to this point. Um, Tiggy and Barbara have worked long and hard and um, um, we've just had such a wonderful journey together. So I'm excited about the book being published and excited about what's gonna come after because we still have lots of plans. Uh, and I'm excited that people will get to know the true story about George Pointer and the, the Pointer family and um, uh, that the real history of what went on during that time and in that area. So I'm just excited that this is all finally taking place. It's been a long ride, long but we knew we'd get to the end. <laughs> and Bar Barbara and Clara, any, any parting well, words for us? Reparation means repair, and maybe this is the beginning of yeah. repairing what people think of as standard American history, we've been missing so much. And maybe this is a little beginning that we can contribute to repairing mm -hmm. attitudes toward education and history. Yes. It is so much more fun to do this as a team. <laughs> These two, I have to tell you, it's more fun than doing it just by ourselves. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, we really appreciate all four of you joining us tonight and to all of you who are who are watching uh, on, on Zoom, we've come to the end of our time. And in a few days, this program is gonna be available uh, with closed captioning on YouTube. So feel free to share it with your networks. And if you haven't already, you can pre-order a copy of Between Freedom and Equality through the DC History Center shop. Uh, so please keep an eye on dchistory.org for more book talks. Other programs are coming up in June. Uh, the DC History Center is a nonprofit, and uh, always grateful to each of you who make uh, donations and, when, and who made donations when you registered for tonight's program, because those donations go directly to producing this kind of program and future programs like it. Uh, where, can, where can we get the book? Uh, DC History Center shop. The, the, they have a bookshop down okay. at the DC the History book. Center. Here. He just told us. And so the DC History Center also gratefully recognizes the support from Events DC and the DC Commissioner, Com Commission on the Arts and Humanities. Uh, thanks again to all four of you for, for joining me tonight. And I also wanna recognize behind the scenes, you didn't see them, but uh, Laura Brower Haggard, Maggie Downing, Katrina Ingraham, Jane Levy, Ann McDonough, Stephanie Rojas, Marin, Marin Orchard, and Tamara Wright, who all contributed to the program to help make it happen. And with that, 
we are done. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope to see you at another DC History event. Great. Take care. Uh -huh. Bye. -bye.